Well, this is a pretty underwhelming title screen. Nearly two years ago, I made a full review of Skyward Sword. I'd like to think that I have improved since then, so if you decide to go watch it if you haven't already, good luck. After playing through the HD version with a more mature and open mindset compared to when I first played the game as a preteen, I had discovered a newfound appreciation for Skyward Sword's focus on linearity, and its flaws didn't bother me as much anymore. I learned to love Skyward Sword in a way I never thought I would. I wasn't planning on revisiting the game again so soon, let alone make another video on it, but I figured, one, I'm already replaying every 3D Zelda game, it would feel a little weird to ignore this one and not give it proper attention, and two, I do think I have enough new stuff to talk about to just making this video without repeating myself too much. And in a world where we now have both Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom, I'm starting to see that Skyward Sword kind of marks an important moment in the franchise. It ended up being the turning point where Nintendo realized that it was time to take the series in a drastically different direction, one that it likely won't veer away from for the next couple of years, or even decades. It marks the end of an era for the Zelda series, for better or for worse depending on who you ask. So why not? Let's talk about The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword again. Ah, oh, sh**. Here we go again. I glossed over most of the details about Skyward Sword's development last time, and I think it's important to go over it to understand why it turned out the way it did, and how Aonuma was already itching to reinvent the formula long before Breath of the Wild started being worked on. So Twilight Princess came out on the Wii in 2006, but seeing as the game was originally designed for the GameCube, the Wii still needed a 3D Zelda game to call its own, one specifically tailor-made for it. In the early stages of development, the team had a couple of ideas that would go on to influence how the new Zelda game would be designed. For one, they felt that they had bit off more than they could chew when they made Twilight Princess's world bigger than it needed to be, and wanted this new entry to provide a more compact and dense experience. Aonuma wanted to break away from the series' traditional flow that had been used in every 3D Zelda game since Ocarina of Time, so instead of creating yet another explorable grassy field that the player would return to after completing a dungeon, the team ended up creating smaller overworlds that ended up being disconnected from each other, with the sky serving as the top-level overworld containing the bulk of the game's side content. And of course, motion controls. Twilight Princess wasn't exactly a proper showcase of how the tech could enhance a Zelda game. The fact that they were a glorified button press made the whole thing feel incredibly gimmicky. Miyamoto especially wanted to rectify this. The man has always been an advocate for creating new and innovative ways to play a video game, so it was important to him that the motion controls for the new Zelda game were accurate, responsive, and fun. And when Wii Sports Resort came out in 2009, and showed that the Wii Remote could handle motion-controlled swordplay with the Wii Motion Plus accessory, making this a reality for Zelda now looked like it could be done. The same year that Wii Sports Resort came out, Nintendo released the first teaser image for Zelda on the Wii. And the following year at E3, the game was officially unveiled and Miyamoto himself came on stage to demonstrate the game in action in front of a live audience. A moment that now lives in utter infamy. Nope. <laughs> these are these are some fast spiders. <laughs> Ugh, it never stops being embarrassing. The motion controls didn't work. Miyamoto blamed wireless interference, but I think most people know that the game just wasn't ready to be shown off this way yet. And this was 2010. The whole motion control fad was starting to die off. Gamers started seeing the tech as an unnecessary gimmick catered towards casuals that only hurt more hardcore titles. This demo certainly didn't help improve the public's perception of motion controls. The game got delayed so that they could fix the controls and to polish the game as a whole. Skyward Sword was becoming one of the most expensive Zelda games to produce. The game ended up taking five years to get made, but only about three of those years were spent getting some serious work done on the game itself, while the first two were mainly spent figuring out what direction to take the game in and whether implementing the motion controls was worth it. Things may not have been going smoothly, but the team wasn't about to give up. Nintendo was committed to make Skyward Sword a Zelda game to be excited about, a Zelda game that would disprove claims that the franchise was falling behind compared to the rest of the industry while still celebrating its legendary legacy. 2011 marked the Zelda series' 25th anniversary, and that year's E3 seemed like the perfect time to turn things around. E3 2011 holds a very special place in my heart. This was the year that I discovered that there was this annual event where new games and potentially new consoles would get announced. This was the year that I started broadening my horizons and tried out new games. Through good word of mouth from my friends and the internet, this was the year that I became interested in Zelda. I was on summer vacation. It was early in the morning, I was waking up from a sleepover I had with my cousins. It was the day after E3, and using the internet channel on the Wii that was plugged into the living room TV, we put on Nintendo's press conference from the previous day. 
And then this started playing. I don't think I can properly put into words just how speechless I was watching this. The music and visuals on the screen elicited this perfect cacophony of emotions that had me feeling a deep connection to a franchise that I never really had a connection with. Even without having beaten any of the games myself, without knowing what they were even about, at that moment, I fell in love with The Legend of Zelda. And Ocarina of Time 3D and Skyward Sword became my most anticipated games of that year. In hindsight, these were probably the first games I was ever excited for. This was the first time I experienced the wait from reveal to release, which is now one of my favorite things about being a video game fan, most of the time. I got Ocarina of Time 3D a couple of months later when I got a 3DS and loved it to death, but I was still keeping up with any new promotional material and news that would be released for Skyward Sword. Just a couple more months and it would be mine. November 11th, the day that reviews for Skyward Sword started making the rounds. It was the most critically acclaimed Zelda game since Ocarina of Time. It seemed like this was going to be a game for the ages, an enduring classic that was going to give me a life-changing experience. A lot of people I knew at the time were raving about Skyrim, and I remember I'd shove the review scores for Skyward Sword in their faces to show them that the Wii could still put out masterpieces. I was pretty insecure if that wasn't clear enough. Shortly thereafter, the game came out. I got it on Black Friday because I naively thought that because it was Black Friday, I'd get a discount on the game even though it had just come out. That wasn't the case, but my dad still drove me to Toys R Us and bought it for me, along with the Wii Motion Plus add-on. I spent the next couple of weeks or so playing Skyward Sword and enjoying it, but a part of me was also pretending to enjoy it more than I actually was. Keep in mind, I'd played and beaten only one Zelda game before this. A lot of the things that I loved about Ocarina, like the interconnected world that feeded into the feeling of adventure were missing in Skyward Sword, and some of the things I wasn't liking about Skyward Sword, like the abundance of cutscenes and text that interrupted the gameplay, weren't present in Ocarina. I won't say I wasn't having fun because I was, mostly, but I distinctly remember wishing I was having more fun. Then when I got to Lanayru Desert, specifically this section with the quicksand, I gave up on the game. I couldn't figure out that I needed to use the beetle to drop bombs on the ampelis to be able to use their shells to cross the quicksand, so I kept failing and failing over and over again until I had enough. And it didn't help that Desert is one of my least favorite level motifs in video games. It only added to how bored I was getting. I want to make something clear. When I was a kid, I didn't give up on games so easily. I had all the free time in the world. I had played lots of games before this where I'd spend hours, days, even weeks sometimes trying to get past a specific part and still managed to push through despite my frustration. But Skyward Sword was one of the only games that made me go, no, I don't want to play this anymore. Not right now. I want to play something else. And considering this was a game that I was insanely excited for, this left me pretty bummed out. Months had gone by since the last time I touched Skyward Sword, closer to a year actually. And it was around this time I started noticing the complete 180 that discussions about the game had taken. And the more time that passed, the more Skyward Sword was becoming the most hated game in the entire series. Yeah, the Zelda cycle was already a thing by this point, but this was the first time I witnessed it firsthand and it left me very confused and conflicted about the game. Because overall, I liked what I played, but I was young and I had very little confidence in myself or my ability to form my own opinions. So I started letting others form my opinions for me. I touched on this in my Ocarina of Time video. I was literally that one meme about people letting YouTubers tell them what their opinions should be. Combine this with the adolescent angst that was starting to build within me and I ultimately decided I hated Skyward Sword. When I came back to it to finally continue where I left off, I played it through a very hateful lens. I had already made up my mind about how I felt about the game before I even reached the credits. The thing is, even if I didn't want to admit it, I remained conflicted about Skyward Sword for several years after I beat it. Part of me knew that I didn't despise the game as much as I had led myself to believe, that there were aspects about it that I couldn't help but look back on fondly. But I couldn't think this way. The internet said I'm not allowed to like Skyward Sword. It's linear, it's repetitive, Fi sucks, Skyrim's better, and Link's lips are too big. 
Did I actually agree with that stuff though? Maybe some of it to a certain extent, but maybe I was treating the game too harshly. When Breath of the Wild came out in 2017, a lot of that game felt like a direct response to Skyward Sword. It was the anti-Skyward Sword, if you will. I loved Breath of the Wild, but not once during my first playthrough did I think, this is the kind of game I wanted Skyward Sword to be. Even though it solved most of the supposed issues I had with that game. If anything, I recognized there were certain parts of Breath of the Wild I felt were executed better in Skyward Sword, like the story, side quests, and dungeons. If anything, Breath of the Wild was more of a departure from what I thought I loved about the series than Skyward Sword ever was. Yet, I didn't hate Breath of the Wild. I adored it. So then why did I claim to hate Skyward Sword? So that game is more railroaded. So what? What exactly did that mean to me? After all, I liked games like The Last of Us and Uncharted, which are the poster boys for railroaded video games. Did the linearity really affect my enjoyment of the game? Or did I just think this way because it was what everybody else said? These were the kinds of questions I started asking myself. And so when I replayed the game a couple of years later when Skyward Sword HD came out, now that I was older and was able to think for myself and form my own thoughts about it, I was finally able to accurately articulate my feelings and say, with confidence, that I liked Skyward Sword. This epiphany is what inspired me to make that original video, and I wasn't the only one who had a change of heart. While a lot of people still don't like Skyward Sword, which is completely fine by the way, the release of Skyward Sword HD after fans had their taste of a non-linear open world Zelda game started sparking up talking points like this, and this. In fact, some fans started yearning for a return to form, as Skyward Sword HD reminded them of what Breath of the Wild lacked. It's kind of funny how things end up playing out, huh? Open world games used to be seen as the definitive way forward for the industry. Like, every game needed to be open world and have a bajillion side quests and take hundreds of hours to finish. And now that 3D Zelda games are open world, you start seeing a line separating the two sides of the fandom. The side that prefers the traditional formula, and the side that insists that Zelda isn't Zelda if it isn't open world, non-linear, and exploration focus. And then there's people like me who appreciate all styles of Zelda because we're just better than everybody else. Skyward Sword is special not just because it was the last non-open world 3D Zelda game, but because it's not quite traditional either. Even Aonuma himself has said that he believes Twilight Princess is the game that actually marked the end of the traditional Zelda formula. This makes Skyward Sword one of the most unique entries in the series, from its design to its controls. I covered a lot of this stuff in the original video, but I want to elaborate on my original points and go into more detail detail about certain things I feel I brushed over the first time. First off, the presentation. I know some folks aren't a big fan of the character designs in this game, namely the faces, but I'm gonna go as far as saying that this might just be my favorite Zelda art style to date, or at least second to Breath of the Wild. The whole game looks like a beautiful watercolor painting, and in a way, playing the game at a lower resolution like on the Wii creates a more convincing brushstroke effect on environmental elements like clouds and trees that does a better job of replicating the Impressionist era artwork than inspired the game's visuals. The colors are so vibrant, a nice change after Twilight Princess's overly brown color palette, which does fit that game's vibe mind you. But compared to Twilight Princess, Skyward Swords' graphics have definitely aged more gracefully. They combine the realism of Twilight Princess with the cell shaded cartoony look of Wind Waker to create a nice middle ground between the two, and this allows the characters to be super expressive once again. But even though the game still looks good just by increasing the resolution, I definitely would have appreciated if the HD remaster updated more assets, like replacing the low res textures with higher res ones like Twilight Princess HD did. Alas, this is the most basic remaster of the bunch when it comes to the graphical enhancements, and you can pretty much get the same results by bumping up the resolution of the original with Dolphin. 60 FPS is nice though. The cutscenes in this game are on another level. Excellent camera work, action scenes while rare have great pacing. This is the most ambitious Zelda game yet when it comes to its cinematics, and the music especially helps convey the emotion and tone of each story beat, and I love the moments when the music matches up perfectly with what's happening on screen. The orchestral soundtrack makes boss fights feel more epic. The town feel more whimsical. The interactions between the characters feel more innocent and pure.
I wouldn't call it my favorite Zelda soundtrack, but the highs are simply amazing. And just like Wind Waker, there's a musical cue that plays with each one of your sword strikes, making each hit feel that much more satisfying. <laughs> Speaking of sword strikes, let's talk about the combat. I stand by what I said in my original review. I really like Skyward Sword's combat. In fact, it's a part of the game I can say I've always liked. I can recognize how the enemy design can make the combat feel a little too samey, since a good chunk of encounters boil down to finding the right angle to hit an opponent at, and it can make the pacing of the swordplay feel off for some, especially against enemies like Bokoblins that can have godlike reaction times and block your attacks in an instant. There is also a noticeable lack of options compared to something like Twilight Princess with the absence of additional skills, and the 1v1 nature of the camera when you lock onto an enemy makes it a little awkward when you throw multiple enemies into the equation. Personally, I quite enjoy the slower, more methodical approach you have to take when fighting in this game. For example, enemies like the Zolfos will attempt to punish you if you don't quickly attack them when they're open, or if you accidentally hit their armor. This means you can't just swing all willy-nilly, and you have to prepare, in case you do mess up, to respond quickly with a dodge or a shield bash, and utilizing your shield in encounters like these can lead to some super aggressive gameplay if you're good enough. I feel the combat is even better in hero mode, since each mistake leads to a greater punishment, and it's actually how I played the game this time. I now consider this my preferred difficulty for Skyward Sword, as the game is relatively easy in normal mode, and you don't have to strategize as much in terms of what to carry in your adventure pouch when playing on the lower difficulty. And speaking of the adventure pouch, I really like the real-time nature of it. In the past, the action would pause when you brought up your inventory to select a potion, and would pause again when drinking said potion. In Skyward Sword, bringing up the item wheel doesn't pause the game, and neither does using an item, so you you have to be careful if you want to heal up in the middle of a fight. But of course, the main issue most people have with the combat is the motion control aspect. Now, I don't think it's in anyone's right to argue with someone about their experiences with the motion controls, because it's going to vary from person to person. It's an incredibly subjective thing to discuss. Just because I liked the motion controls and felt that they were responsive during my time with the game, doesn't mean this was the case for everybody. There are just so many factors that can affect someone's experience. Interference from other devices, a faulty controller, whether the player is even physically able to use the controls, that's why I respect the HD version for adding the button-only controls, as it allows Skyward Sword to be free from its original, less accessible control scheme. I have two problems with this though. One, there still isn't a left-handed motion control option, and considering that this was something people complained about when the game came out on the Wii, I find the lack of this option hard to excuse. And two, there's not enough customization. For example, I don't like button-only controls when it comes to swordplay. Sword fighting with this control scheme doesn't feel very natural to me. Having to hold down the L button to move the camera alone shows how much more restrictive the button only controls are. The game was designed with motion controls in mind, so in fighting, that's how I prefer to play the game. But the game also has a lot of pointless required motion controls, like when swimming or flying your loft wing. In cases like these, I would have loved being able to use the button only controls, but I can't because you can only pick one or the other. Button only controls for everything? or nothing. Again, with how much people asked for more robust control customization when the game was released, I am shocked that an update wasn't released to address this. And if I can double down on something else, the HD version's motion controls are nowhere near as good as the Wii version, at least in their reliability. The Wii Motion Plus did a better job of staying calibrated and in sync with my hand movements than the Joy-Cons. This is something I've noticed in a lot of Switch games. The Joy-Cons are terrible. What? That's the end of the sentence. No, seriously. The Joy-Cons are terrible at keeping the gyroscope calibrated, since there isn't a sensor bar for it to use as a reference point. When it works, it feels really good, but after just a couple of quick movements, the whole thing gets totally f***. Hell, even when I'm not moving the controller that much, the gyro just borks itself. Being able to reset it on the fly with the Y button is handy, but there were still way too many times when the unreliability of the motion controls made me take unnecessary damage or completely miss landing on a sky island, making me look like a freaking idiot. Since I'm already on the topic of the HD version's changes, some of the improvements feel sort of half-baked, and what should have been simple quality of life additions just weren't included. The sky feels super empty, I wasn't expecting that to be any different in the remake. Master, but I was expecting Traversal to, at the very least, feel less slow. But the Loftwing's speed was untouched, and there still isn't any form of fast travel, either in the sky or the surface. When on the surface, couldn't there have just been an option to bring up the map when checking a bird statue and just have the game cut to where I want to go, instead of making me leave and re-enter the region I was in? And then, 
there's Phi. The reduced number of Phi's Hey Listen moments is often cited as the remaster's best improvement, as she doesn't interrupt the gameplay or repeat information you just learned from another character as often anymore. But that's the issue. It doesn't happen as often. It still happens too damn often from what I've observed. Sometimes you're simply given the choice to listen to Fi's redundant advice in moments that would have been mandatory lectures in the Wii version. But other times, you don't have a choice, so she still interrupts you when what she has to say is still redundant. Are the memory modules in your system short-circuiting? Do I have to send you in for repairs? Because what you're teaching me is something someone else just told me about. Master, I detect a 90% probability that I suffer from short-term memory loss. And unfortunately, my mind hasn't changed about her farewell at the end of the game. 90% of Fi's interactions with Link are her explaining shit to him. She hardly has any thoughts or feelings of her own. She doesn't react to or play any part in the story's emotional moments. Only rarely does something akin to a personality shine through, and it's kind of cute when it does. But these examples are few and far between. I get that the story explanation is that she was made for one purpose, and she is simply following orders like a drone. But there have been plenty of stories about the emotionless robot programmed with one goal in mind, who learns what it is to be human and starts exhibiting human traits as a result of the relationship they cultivate over the course of a long journey with a human. Doing the same with Phi may have been cliche, a little been there done that, but if you ask me, it still would have been better than how she is in the final game, and the goodbye between her and Link would have felt earned. As it stands, it doesn't feel earned. She says that her time with Link is some of the most precious data she's recorded, but why couldn't this have been shown through meaningful character interactions instead of it just being told to us. I wish this moment resonated with me more, but it doesn't. I think I've been negative long enough, so let's switch things up. While most of the sky isn't terribly exciting, if there's one good thing about it, it's definitely Skyloft. This is the closest a town in a Zelda game has gotten to feeling as alive as Clock Town in Majora's Mask, and it's all thanks to the residents of Skyloft making the town feel like a lively community. It's a shame that there isn't a day and night cycle that shows the characters going about and living their lives like in that game, but what we have here isn't bad either. From the night academy to the plaza to the bazaar, to how everyone knows each other since Skyloft is framed as this haven above the clouds where the last of humanity lives, it all comes together to create a believable community of people, a community you can't help yourself from wanting to know more about, learning characters' names, what they do, and bringing joy into their lives. At the center of this feeling of community is Batro, the friendly monster who asks you to help him become human by collecting gratitude crystals that form from intense feelings of gratitude. By helping Batro, you help Skyloft, and by helping Skyloft, you help Batro. You also get some nice rewards and experience some pretty entertaining side quests. The side quest objectives themselves aren't anything too special. Go fetch this item, deliver this letter, talk to this person, so on and so forth. Mini games can also be hit or miss. But the best thing about the side quests is that they provide insight into the kind of people that live in this town. And like the NPCs in Majora's Mask, you start to develop a connection to them. Like Fledge, who you help overcome his feelings of weakness by getting him hooked on roids. Or Pippet and Corain, who start dating as a result of your actions, much to Colin's distress. Or if you go down a different road, you help the ancestor of the paper hand from Majora's Mask find true love in Colin, who she will now haunt while he sleeps for the rest of his days. Which is why this is the option I always choose, cause Colin is kind of a jerk. There is one side quest I really don't like though, and you can probably guess which one it is. No matter which route you take, the side quest with Beatrice ends up feeling a little too mean-spirited for my liking. Seriously, what twisted f wrote these dialogue options? This quest just makes me feel icky, and any side quest that involves this little sh gets an automatic point taken off. But if it means Batro can finally be among the people, I guess I'll do them all then. Like Majora's Mask, I have to do all of the side quests. I can't have it any other way. But while I like the characters you meet in the sky, I can't really say the same for most of the characters on the surface. The Kikwis are cute, but don't really do anything of note. The Magma are kind of just there, though it's kind of cool that they have their own treasure hunting operation going on. I didn't even know Perella were called Perella until I looked it up, so take that as you will. The main surface dwellers I do like are Gorko and Skipper. Gorko because of how he instantly becomes buddies with Link, and it's funny seeing how he has all these questions about his research that Link knows the answers to but refuses to share with him, and Skipper's story is really tragic. He died searching for his crew after his ship was commandeered by pirates, and since the ship was never found, well, 
All of his friends died too. Not only that, he left behind a family as you learn when you enter his cabin. And the pictures on the walls are a really memorable instance of environmental storytelling. Just one of the many reasons that Laneru is my favorite region. Oh god damn it, Fi. If there's one thing that gets more hate than Fi though, or even the motion controls, it's definitely the linearity and structure of Skyward Sword. Now, I already went into detail regarding what I think about linearity in Zelda and video games as a whole in the Twilight Princess video. And a lot of what I said applies to Skyward Sword. In fact, in fact, because Skyward Sword was designed to have a more compact world than Twilight Princess to begin with, I feel that it strikes a better balance between linearity and the exploration that the series is so famous for. But at the same time, it suffers a lot from a repetitive structure because Skyward Sword does not know when to stop. The game is split up into three acts, and in each act you visit each of the three surface regions to progress the story. The whole backtracking concept itself isn't so much of a problem for me. In the second third of the game, you spend most of the revisits exploring new areas you didn't get to see the first time. Your arsenal of items has grown now, allowing you to open up new sections of the map. In a way, it's similar to a Metroid game, when you get a new item that lets you delve deeper into the planet. Most of my issues are with the last third of the game specifically, not counting the the Nehru region, the final visits to the surface have you retreading the same ground you've covered multiple times by this point. Taking away my items and having me sneak around to get them back isn't enough to distract me from the fact that the game is making me climb this damn mountain for the fourth time. Skyward Sword could have done away with most of its last act altogether, and I legitimately think it would have been a better and more polished journey for it. Things like saving the Thunder Dragon to unlock the boss rush could have just been optional post-game side quests. Just have Levias teach Link the hero song right away, and as an added bonus, make the second visits to the surface the ones you can tackle in any order. The adventure would still be at a respectable length, and the team wouldn't have felt the need to recycle so much content to pad out yet another MacGuffin hunt, like making you fight the Imprisoned back to back within the the span of an hour. Though to be fair, you can space out the imprisoned fights more if you visit the other regions first. Just be careful about talking to any game-breaking Gorons in the Wii version if you do this. Even the second third of the game isn't entirely immune to repetition. Like why make us revisit the Skyview Temple? I thought there would have at least been a unique mini-boss to justify this, but the mini-boss from the first trek through this dungeon just makes clones of itself. Going back to Lake Floria to get the Water Dragon's Basin of Water to open up the Fire Sanctuary is actually a good test of your memory, but this moment is soured by the third third Elden Volcano climb the game has forced you to do. What is it with this game's obsession with this f***ing volcano? This all taints what would have been a rock-solid adventure where you're always seeing something new despite there only being three regions. Skyward Sword puts more care into its overworld than any of the previous 3D games. If we're strictly talking level design, there's a lot more content between each major dungeon now, and it's because the overworld, despite not being as open as past overworlds, uses its compact design to its advantage by having actual objectives to complete and more environmental puzzles than ever before. And despite the linear nature of the level design, there's quite a few instances where the game lets you spread your wings and tackle a mission in a non-linear fashion. The more I think about it, the more these sections feel like a precursor to the way Divine Beasts are designed in Breath of the Wild. Quite a few of Skyward Sword's ideas were kept when the series made the transition to open world. The stamina meter, weapon durability, using spoils and materials to upgrade equipment, and probably a couple of other things I'm missing. Exploration is still a key gameplay element, and you want to explore to find goddess cubes that can lead to some dope ass rewards, and treasure chests and digging spots that can contain rupees and materials. Rupees are very lucrative this time around since there's a lot of expensive shit. Thanks a lot, Beetle. <laughs> materials and monster parts are used for the game's item upgrade system. You can give your weapons new perks and buffs, make ammo expansions larger, make your shields more durable, which can I just say how much I love that this game gives you a reason to switch shields? The execution isn't perfect since if you're good at parrying, you don't really need anything other than the sacred shield after you get it. But for once, the iron shield doesn't make the wooden shield obsolete. A lot of Lanayru's enemies have electrical attacks, so a wooden shield that doesn't conduct electricity is more suitable here. These areas are just so fun to play through. I understand if it can feel too on rails for some people, but personally, I can't help but have a blast exploring, fighting enemies, seeing the gradual evolution of a mechanic that gets explored even further in the area's dungeon. It all links together wonderfully and offers a satisfying sense of progression. The Silent Realms recontextualize the Tears of Light concept in a fresh and more interesting way in my opinion, making the process of searching for the tears incredibly tense and nerve-wracking, where your chances of success boil down to how much you've explored and familiarized yourself with the layouts of each 
region, and it bears repeating. Despite it being the area that made me drop the game, Laneru is fantastic. It manages to make a desert area exciting with how it plays with the past and present through the time shift stones. The first visit has you keeping track of a two-layered map to navigate the desert, and the second visit, the Sand Sea, is a part of the game I find even the most vocal of Skyward Sword's detractors rarely have anything bad to say about. It is one of the most effective lead-ups to a dungeon I've ever seen, giving us a full realization of Wind Waker's ghost ship quest by making the pirate ship you're searching for the actual dungeon. And my opinions on the dungeons haven't changed, but if you'd like to know how I'd rank them overall compared to the other 3D Zelda games, I'd say they're a small step below Twilight Princess, but on equal footing with Majora's Mask, for the most part. The Ancient Cistern is still my favorite of the bunch. The door switch puzzle that requires you to take note of these symbols painted on the statue in the main room, the entire underground area, the many use cases for the whip, and for having the most spectacular boss fight in the entire game. The sand ship is excellent, of course, and so is the Laneru mining facility, except for this enemy that teases you with all the money it drops when you kill it, that you can't collect because it falls into a bottomless pit. But I want to give more attention to Skykeep this time. Like some of the objectives in the overworld, it experiments with a non-linear design in a mostly linear adventure. Most players will have a different dungeon experience because of the central gimmick of arranging the layout by moving the rooms and trying to create a route to the pieces of the Triforce. Each room serves as a final test of every mechanic and idea that has been presented to you, forcing you to take full advantage of every one of your items like any good final dungeon in a Zelda game should. Though if you ask me, this dungeon would have been even cooler if the rooms that contain the Triforce were somehow a test of the quality that that room specific Triforce piece represents. Like the combat room should have led to the Triforce of Power, a puzzle heavy room could have led to the Triforce of Wisdom, and maybe a room with a perilous set of obstacles could have led to the Triforce of Courage. This is just an idea I had. It's not at all a jab at the dungeon or anything, which is already fantastic as it is. I guess the last thing I want to talk about is the story. I don't have much more to add to what I've already said about the plot itself. I still think it's really good. I understand it can feel a little too much like the world's longest treasure hunt, and that the goddess's plan can feel kind of contrived. Like, do you want Link to save the world or not? Why didn't you just tell the water dragon and give the chosen hero her part of the hero's song as soon as she met him, if she already knew he was going to need it anyway? And while I think Girahim is a great recurring villain, he wastes so many opportunities to kill Link. And he keeps saying, I'll get you next time, but when next time comes, he's just like, eh. I don't really feel like it. Sick him, Kalakdos! He just lets Link and his sword get stronger and stronger and is surprised when this kid, now decked out with 20 heart containers, an invincible shield, and a sword that can do this, is able to defeat him. The plot itself isn't why I love Skyward Sword's narrative so much though. The story's emotional core is carried by its characters. Groose is still one of the best side characters in the franchise, since he actually goes through a proper character arc, and teaches us that even those who aren't necessarily destined for greatness can still do great things. He feels like more of a proper companion to Link than Fi ever does, and just look at him. It's f***ing Groose. This version of Link is undoubtedly my favorite thus far. Like Wind Waker and Twilight Princess, a lot of care was taken into making Link feel like a character of his own. He may still be a mute, but the dialogue options at the very least to give him some kind of a voice. And some of these are so humorous and cheesy, which makes sense. This Link is a pretty dopey boy. He spends most of his day sleeping. He's implied to be a pretty carefree and lazy guy at the beginning of the game with his head always in the clouds. But when the call to action comes, he truly proves himself worth worthy of being a hero, subverting everyone's expectations and preconceived notions of him, which is probably part of the reason why Girahim doesn't take him all that seriously at first, and lets him go scot-free as many times as he does. If there's one trait about Link that Girahim and even characters like Impa initially underestimate, it's how much he cares about Zelda. The search for Zelda is such a good motivator because the first hour of the game was spent showing just how good of friends they are, and how lovable and adorable of a character Zelda is this time around. Their relationship is the drive force of this story. When Zelda acquires Hylia's memories, she herself says that the goddess counted on her bond with Link to motivate him to travel to the surface and thus set Hylia's plan into motion. That's pretty f***ed up, but it works. You want to find Zelda. You want things to go back to the way they were, but that can't happen. Link and Zelda have roles to play that are way out of their control. They have no choice but to play their part if they want to have any hope of reuniting. This part of the game right after getting the last sacred flame may be a really big plot dump, but the emotional weight of this moment is so powerful and heartbreaking. The animation, the expressions, the music, the part when Zelda asks Link to wake her up this time calling back to how the adventure began, it's one of the most perfectly executed moments in Zelda's history. And ignoring the fact that it leads to the worst act of the game, the ending itself is freaking 
awesome. The final Silent Realm being in Skyloft, bringing the journey around full circle. Skykeep is amazing as I talked about already. The fact that this is one of the only Zelda games where Link acquires and gets to use the full Triforce. Gear him coming in and ruining the party. Sending hordes and hordes of enemies at Link because he's had enough of his shit and is so close to winning. You gotta admit, when it truly counts, Gear him gives it his all, which leads to an incredibly intense one-on-one -on -one duel with him. And Demise's design is so badass. He may only be around for 10 minutes, but he leaves one hell of an impact. And a lot of that can be attributed to how thrilling the fight against him is. It highlights the aggressive gameplay that the game's combat can allow for. When you know his patterns and timings and are able to parry each of his attacks flawlessly, while getting as many hits in of your own as you can, there's no better feeling. It's the best battle in the game. And the use of the Skyward Strike is so creative. And this never gets old. Thing is, not everyone agrees. I've spent a good amount of time in both videos I've made on this game, praising Skyward Sword's many strengths, but also pointing out its many weaknesses. It contains some of the highest highs and also some of the lowest lows Zelda has seen across its over 35 year history. I strongly believe that it's a great game, but I also understand why it felt a little disappointing to me back then, and why it got the hate it did. Skyward Sword did challenge quite a few series traditions, and definitely feels like an outlier among the rest of the traditional 3D Zelda games. But to some, it's not an outlier in a good way, and its attempts to evolve the franchise clearly didn't sit right with everyone. There's also the matter of Zelda's overall place in gaming as a whole. As crazy as it may sound because it's Zelda we're talking about, there was a time when the franchise wasn't so bulletproof. There was so much at stake when Twilight Princess was being made because if it didn't do well, Zelda may not have died, but it may have been deemed a lower priority IP for Nintendo going forward, since sales figures just kept dropping and dropping. It may have ended up in a similar situation that Metroid found itself in for a while. And then along came Skyward Sword, the Zelda game with the longest development time, highest budget, and release for the best selling home console Nintendo had ever made, and it ended up being one of the worst selling 3D Zelda games ever. And as the honeymoon period ended and the backlash began, people started to question whether this series that was known for setting standards in the medium could even survive in the modern era. An era where graphics, stories, production values, and the worlds being built to immerse players were only getting more ambitious. As we know now, Nintendo obviously disproved all of these doubts, but it came at a cost. Not everyone is a fan of this new direction. Recently, Aonuma came out and said that Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom will serve as the blueprint for Zelda for the first foreseeable future. But as Skyward Sword HD reminded a lot of people, there's still an appeal to the traditional Zelda formula. There's a reason why it was a formula. It worked for a very long time. So I can definitely understand how disheartening it must be knowing that the day Nintendo makes another traditional 3D entry may never come. I won't lie, it bums me out a little too. But it can't be denied that Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom have invigorated a level of interest in the series on a scale that has never been seen before. This is a change that Zelda needed. And hey, I wouldn't say a return to form is completely out of the realm of possibilities. After all, isn't Breath of the Wild in spirit a return to form as well? Skyward Sword may mark the end of an era for Zelda, but it also marks the beginning of a new one. And like the previous era, I plan on sticking around for the new one and anything else the future may hold. This game and I have had quite a rocky history, but when push comes to shove, I know it can deliver one hell of an amazing adventure. One that I know I'll revisit again someday. <laughs> He's sitting on a toilet. <laughs>